constructive view. Yeah. This is a, that's mine. I want to yeah, take it from Jimmy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you can move that. <laughs> well, I can the garden. The Boston Garden gets to see everything above the plant, huh? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we're glad to see. There's a chair right next to you. We're glad to see some uh, some people here that are other than family. Oh wait, no, there is. <laughs> so everybody must be like it's celebrating with, with their moms. It's all family. That's all good. We're always all family, right? No matter who. But happy Mother's Day to everyone. Thank you. You're welcome. To you too. <laughs>
the message today that God wants to be a part of our lives. He doesn't reach down and grab your hand. He offers His and says, I'm here. Now, the thing about that is that sometimes we think, well, oh, so it's me reaching up to Him. Really, no. He's got His arm around us. He's carrying us and everything else. And what He's saying is, is this little other part that I'd like to have with you, relationship. I'm carrying you the whole way. So often we think about how much we do and how, boy, God loves me because, or God doesn't love me because, and it's just such a wrong idea. God loves us. He carries us. He brings us where we go. But he also does that extra where he offers and says, be a part of this. You don't have to be, because I've done everything for you. But you can be a part of this if you want to be. And I'm just going to rub my hand because I'm getting cramps in my hand from yesterday working on my house. And I can't play the guitar when it does that. So I'm just talking and <laughs> making it sound really spiritual. But what I'm trying to do is heal myself. Just play air moment. guitar. Yeah, I think I might have to. Well, right. That's all right. If we need a switch up, we will. Yeah. Venus, today is Mother's Day. I wanted to do the song Bring It Home because Bring It On Home because I just I know it's not referring to mothers when they wrote this, but there's so many words in this song that just go for moms too. Like it just goes for moms too. So I want to sing Bring It On Home this morning in <coughs> all those moms.
safe to my adult kids. So. All right, we're going to do Chain Breaker now. I don't know if we, have we done this here with you guys? Yep. Yeah. Maybe, uh, maybe once or twice? Or? Uh -huh. yep. Okay, all right, just checking. You've been walking the same old road for miles and miles. You've been hearing the same old voice tell the same old lies. Trying to fill the same old holes inside. There's a better life.
I like the second verse of that in particular, um, the spot where it says, when I fall down, you pick me up. I used to work with the kids in lockup, and um, to be able to use those words and say, it's not if I fall down, it's not. because you got it. You're going to fail, you're going to fall, you're going to trip, you're going to stumble. It's the nature of humanity. It's why we need Christ. When I fall down, you pick me up. When I'm dry, you fill my cup. you my all in all. And the funny thing about that song is, in so many songs we sang, I heard one this morning, I forget what it was on the, on the radio coming here, listening to the guy preaching stuff, and, but it's like, um, you are my all in all. Now, first of all, notice my voice. Because when anybody ever says, Jesus, you are my all in all. You know why they say it that way? Because they know they're full of crap. Okay? Say it all you want. Jesus is not your all in all. You want him to be. But what he is, is he's all in all of everything you need to be right with God. That's what's true. And as much as you want him to be your all in all, He'll never be your all in all because you're human and you let other stuff get in the way. If you have a problem with that, talk to me later and tell me I'm wrong and we can have a conversation. But I really don't think I am because the Bible is pretty clear. And as we talk today, a little bit of that might come up. But today it's about moms. It's about, you know, what and who you are and why. And that's a little bit about what we're going to talk about today. Before that... Do we have any announcements that we need to touch base on? Or? I think so. All right. So. Sounds good. The, the insulation got blown in, so we will be sheetrocking. We're going to get the floor down first and then the sheetrock. So anybody who wants to help sheetrock, let me know. All right. So Sounds good. Day that works. And there's no church two weeks. Oh, yes. A reminder again, we are not doing church on Memorial Day weekend, as Tim and Linda's daughter, Jackie, and Colin, oh, everybody probably knows, Colin and Joe's. Sorry. So we are not church. Are we talking because we're not doing church or are we talking because we're <laughs> just making sure? I don't know. Maybe a little bit. A little bit. <laughs> well, anyway, go, and I always say when we don't have church here, what do I say? Go and be the church somewhere else. I mean, it doesn't matter if you're at a picnic with somebody or if you're going to a different church building because if they're really believers, it's the same church there's only one true church right those that believe in christ become the church all right that's a different sermon for a different time but anyway go and be the church all right excellent um did you want to say something Doc? i saw you looking no we'll put you on the spot hi hi Doc. let me say hi Doc. i have another day by the way <laughs> so like she wanted to say something i was like i don't want to leave her out and then i want to embarrass her so that's what i do that's what i do Anyway, last week, Joe um, thankfully stepped in and spoke, and um, he talked about heroes. Heroes of the Bible in particular, but he started with some heroes. Um, does anybody remember some of the ones he said? Underdog. Underdog, yeah. Okay, he was playing this theme songs, and, and Mighty. people were Mighty Mouse, right? And we, all of us that are like over 90 remember what he talked about, and everybody else was like, who? What? Um, it, it's funny because we don't think of ourselves as old that often, but those, those are old cartoons. I mean, we're talking way back when. So when we started doing those heroes, it was like, oh my gosh. Everybody that answered was like, I think I know. And then out came the answer, right? Um, but what was great about it, Joe, you brought about the fact that these heroes of the Bible, a lot like the heroes that we see in the cartoons and whatever we made as kids, they were heroes because of what they did, but in our eyes, we made it about what they did. And it wasn't really about what they did, was it? It was about what God did through them. Okay, so the heroes of the Bible did take steps and do what they could and trust in God, but it wasn't really what they did. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit more today. Um, heroes, all right? For those of you that didn't get last week, We'll talk about some heroes from a little closer to our time. So how many people have seen this movie or the Avengers or any of the Marvel movies, right? Pretty good, right? Um, I think they've been doing a great job with them. Anyway, I um, had this um, poster and I thought 
here's some, here's some heroes that other people will be able to relate to. I was going to give it to Coley, but he's not here, so give this to Coley when you see him, because I think he might like it. All right? Keep it for myself. There you go. <laughs> Absolutely. That's what I meant. Pretend to give it to Cole and put it in your own room. <laughs> um, heroes. Moms are heroes as well, aren't they? I mean, when you think about what moms do, what they've gone through, how much they've impacted our lives, moms are heroes. And when I say that, I don't mean that in a way like, oh, isn't that nice, pat him on the head, you're a hero. No, I'm serious, you guys are heroes. It's unbelievable what you are able to do and the focus you're able to give your kids and your family that I could never do. I can tell you right now, I could never. Uh, it's funny because when we look back into the Bible, quite often we look for heroes that are guys. Right? Don't we? It's, it's the men, oh, look what, they, and they did this and they did that. And even as we talked last week, it's not really what they did, but they did things because they trusted God. And yet, when I look at the ladies in the Bible that did and were heroes, they did some pretty amazing things as well. And most of the time, they're not in the spotlight. The guys tend to be in the spotlight. Because guess what, guys? We are... Don't want to say it? Don't want to admit it? Selfish. We're selfish. I was going to say we're the best. We're the best. See, there it is. Because we're the best and no one else is. No, we're, we are selfish. Are we not? We can do some great things for our kids. We can try and everything like that. But... I, we just don't hold a candle to moms. We just don't. Now, I'm not trying to say this because it's Mother's Day. I'm just stating what I know to be a fact in my life for sure. And I've seen a lot of guys, and they tend to think they do some really cool things um, because they do the things that, like, I'm going to take the kids to the park. Okay, and um, what happened when you got to the park? You went off and rode the roller coaster, and mom watched the kids and made sure they got to the rides that they wanted to go to, right? Um, it's just, we're selfish. And moms, you tend to be selfless. Looking to others. Giving to others. And so I picked a couple of moms um, that I thought I would focus on today. And one of them is my own mom. Because guess what? When you're up front, you get to talk. You get to do things like highlight your mom. Uh, but I, a lot of you know our story growing up. Mom had six kids. Um, Dad passed away. I was seven at the time. And we went right up the row um, year after year after year. Mom and Dad actually enjoyed one another quite a bit when, they, when he was around. So <laughs> lots of kids, OK? And um, <laughs> I'm not going to repeat what he just said, but it was pretty funny. Anyway, um, so because of um, the fact that she had six kids and my father passed away, untimely quite um, she her life changed quite a bit as you can imagine and so mom had to do a lot of things like get a license she had never driven a car right no. that's nuts um, had to get a license had to get a job had to get a lot of counseling um, just to try and deal with the fact that she had six out of control kids in a house and the thing about it is that she came up with a plan and worked the plan the best she could right now, was your plan perfect? No. Because guess what? You do the best you can. But the plan was not about, well, what am I going to do to I? It was about, what can I do to make this the best for the kids? And so when we look at that, that to me is heroic. To be able to stop and say, I'm just going to do what I have to do. And if you had come up with a plan that was all about what your plan was, I don't feel like it would have worked out as well as it has. Um, you see, the house was out of control. Well, I, I like to refer to us as the Brady Bunch from hell. Three boys, three girls, and anything but cohesive. It was nuts. We were along fine, for the most part. Uh, but, you know, the average things like trying to kill each other. Um, Jim and I had a fight that lasted all day one day. It went from upstairs, downstairs, outside, into the hutch, down in the cellar, back upstairs. We would get so exhausted from fighting each other. Now, John was a great help because he said, 
keep going guys, somebody has to win. So, he was helping. Um, and we would sit like three feet away from each other, uh, and, and then when I get a chance, and then all of a sudden someone would leave and off it would go again, all day. I remember um, bashing into the hutch and all the dishes were smashing all around us. Um, little bits and pieces all day. Um, so, it was out of control. Um, and again, not perfect, but mom was doing what she could do. Working and taking care of the house and just doing the thing. And in the end, as out of control as it was, God did some amazing things. Like everybody that's here, everybody in the family knows Christ. That God is changing their lives in some way or another. Again, perfect, not even close. But that God is changing life. How did that happen? I dare say if you tried to make it happen, it probably wouldn't happen. And what I mean by tried to make it, because I know you wanted it to happen, but the plan was not yours. The plan was God's. And this is what I see in the women in the Bible, the moms in the Bible, the thing that I've seen over and over again is that maybe they had a plan, but the plan wasn't so much about executing their plan. It was doing the best they could within the scope of trusting God. And in the end, they knew that somehow God would do it. And I believe that that is part and parcel why you can do as much as you do as moms, and you also um, seem to have that more calm demeanor. Okay? When we start to lose it, guys, what happens? You know, it's like, uh, we white knuckle it. We're going to make this happen. Anybody just me? <laughs> Right? We're going to make this happen. This is the way it needs to be. God will not be honored if it doesn't happen the way I've planned it. Oh, so ugly. How ugly has it gotten? Yeah, get to church on Sunday. we got to get to church. Get your asses in the car. <laughs> no? I didn't say that. No, and you didn't. That's the point. That's the point. We, you know, we're going to make it happen, come hell or high water kind of a thing. Instead of saying, here's the plan, and God, I'm going to walk the best I can in it, but it's not my plan, Chuck. It's your plan. I looked through and I saw many different, um, many different things. The story of Moses um, was one of the first ones I came across. And just like with mom, where does the strength come from to be able to do this? See, if you look at Moses' um, life and you look at the fact that, you know, Moses' mom is going to go ahead and she's going to um, take care of this kid because what's happening, if you look in um, Exodus chapter 1, they're talking about the fact that a new king comes in charge of Egypt. And at that point, he sees that there's a way too many, um, too many Egypt, I mean, uh, too many um, Israelites, okay? They were like mom and dad, they really enjoyed each other. So there were all sorts of Israelites everywhere, okay? And he all of a sudden looks and says, hey, wait a minute. First of all, I didn't have a deal with these guys. That would be the other Pharaoh. And second of all, there's way too many of them. They're going to start, they're going to take over. So what does he do? He comes up with a plan and says, we're going we're gonna to make sure they don't keep populating the way they do. So what's the plan? Anybody know? It says it, yeah, it says it in, um, in one and going into two. He starts to tell the midwives that are, that are doing the verse. He said, listen, if it comes out it's a girl, fine. They get to keep the girl. If it comes out it's a boy, you've got to throw him in the Nile. That's the plan. And so this is happening on a regular basis um, in certain aspects. And in other aspects, it's not happening at all because the midwives are trying to protect. And they're trying to hide and take care of this. But, of course, as soon as the authorities see that there's a baby and it hasn't been taken care of, what do they do? They take care of it. So it's a pretty gross point in history. Moses' mom knows that. Now, I don't even know how to pronounce her name. It's awful. It's uh, Jochebed. That sound, I mean, I read it and I'm like, oh, you know what? That's weird. I didn't even know her name. But, so Jochebed has Moses, okay? And um, so she protects him for three months is what it says in Exodus. It says three months she kept him in the house. Now, she did that because I guess she could kind of hide him and kind of keep him. But after three months, she's like, there's no way I can keep this kid hidden. And if the authorities see him, they're going to they're gonna offer him. So at three months, she comes up with a plan. Now, if you think about her plan, it's nuts. Okay? A lot like 
some of what we have to do as parents is say, well, we're doing the best we can, so we're going to try this. Are those plans very good sometimes? Sometimes they're awful. <laughs> we're just going to try the best we can. But she comes up with a plan to make a basket, to put tar pitch all around it, put the baby in the, in the basket, put it in the river, and then have her daughter watch the basket. Now, why is that a bad idea? Well, the Nile, first of all, it's a pretty wide river, pretty big river, a lot of stuff going on. Um, you got all sorts of things with waves, the baby possibly spilling out, whatever, okay? The other thing is, if you float a basket down the river and they find a baby in it, what's the odds that they're going to kill this baby when they find it? Right? I mean, it makes sense, it's going to kill it. What's the other thing about the Nile River that we know is true? What does it have in it? Yeah, crocodiles and snakes and all sorts of nasty things. And so she pushes this down over towards um, the reeds, and it's going to go over towards where um, Pharaoh's daughter is going to be bathing and doing it. So she has kind of a plan. But is it really just her plan? Or is it something that she feels that here's what I'm going to try, and if you don't push a kid off into the water, and all those things are going on without what? Trusting that there's more to the plan than what she got. In other words, she's trusting God. She's putting this in God's hands. Even it floating down towards the, the um, Pharaoh's daughter, there's nothing. What, what's, what's the odds that she'll go, oh, a baby, hey, I think I'll keep it. I know it's Hebrew, but, you know, I'll keep it anyway. What are the odds of that? Pretty slim. She didn't go up to her and say, hey, listen, if I float a baby down the river, will you take she has to trust God in the process. And this is a lot like what Joe talked about last week with the heroes. Yes, they did some amazing things, but how did they do them? Who gave them the strength? Who gave them the power? Who gave them the insight? It's no different. This book has always been about grace. Right from the beginning. It has always been about the grace of God and saying, if you can just look and see your need for me. You'll come to me, you'll fall at my feet, and believe me, I'll take care of you. That's what it's all about. It really is. So she sets off this plan in motion. The baby goes over there, and sure enough, Pharaoh's daughter sees the baby and says, Hey, a little baby, isn't it cute? So all of a sudden, she's got the heart of the daughter of Pharaoh who says, Hey, let's take care of this one. And because of that, the daughter goes up and says, hey, do you want me to get a Hebrew woman to nurse the baby? And she says, yes, do that. And take care of him until he's old enough and then bring him back to me. That, that, part, of the movie, uh, that part of the story I never got because the movie didn't show it that way. The movie showed that she took it right into the palace and the, and the, and the um, one that was feeding the baby came to the palace, fed it, and left. That's not how it happened. The Bible says that Moses went back with her to the home. She nursed and raised him until he was old enough and then sent him off to the palace. This makes more sense to me because why, I always wondered, why did Moses have such a sense of his Hebrew background? Why did he have such a sense of saying, I need to take care of God's people if he grew up in the palace and never really understood his Hebrew background? He was brought up in a household where his mom brought him up and gave him the faith that he took with him that even in the face of being in the richest palace in the world and could have had anything he wanted to, his heart changed and he said, no, that's not really what I'm about. There's more to this life than living in this palace. These are my people. And mom was the one that instilled that, but how? Again. God did it through her faith and trust in him. Naomi and Ruth, another one I looked up. Now you know about Naomi and Ruth. Naomi, um, uh, I believe Ruth was married to a son and then he died. Okay, so Naomi was her mother-in-law and the son died. So basically Ruth was like, yeah, you don't have to be a part of my life anymore. And there's no, basically no man in the family at this point to take care of us. And back in the day, if you had no man, what'd you have? No future. You had nothing. And Ruth said, I'm not leaving. I'm not leaving you. 
You were too big a part of my life. Why was she such a big part of Ruth's life? Any of you that have mother-in-laws, it's not always that way. Right? Of course, no one here sees it that way, but, you know, some people don't see mother-in-laws as, as this great thing. Ruth saw Naomi as a great, great part of her life. Why? There was something about her, and it came out when she said, I will not leave you. Your faith has, be, I mean, it became a part of her life. She saw something that she couldn't do without. It was huge. And so Ruth said, I will stay with you even until death, and even then I won't leave you. Why did her heart change so much? Naomi was being faithful and loving, and there was something within her soul that Ruth saw and said, I can't get away from that. Now, Ruth, I don't believe, um, was a believer or was of the um, faith of Israel to begin with. And she was actually drawn into it from what she saw through Naomi. Huge difference. She had a plan as well. I'm going to stay with you and I'm going to do this thing and I'm going to go find what they call a kinsman redeemer and this is going to be someone who I will marry and then we will have a future and a hope. But even still, if she only did that, what do we call that nowadays when someone just goes off and marries somebody for their money? <laughs> Gold digger. Gold digger, all sorts of those different things. I have a couple other names that um, I've heard never used. Um, but anyway, though, yeah, just absolutely, you'd be like, oh, that's, that's awful. You're horrible. And yet, she goes off and she says, I'm going to find this kinsman redeemer. But it's not a gold digger situation. Why? Because she's trusting God in the process. And she says, God will take care of us. God will provide for us. And she didn't just go and try and find anybody. She trusted that God would find the right one. And as she went and gleaned the fields, because that's all they could basically do, it's almost like um, snap nowadays, whatever. Um, that was their version of it, welfare. You get to go in the field and take what they hadn't gotten. And you can take that as your um, means of survival. And as she did that, she met the one. And in the process, married him, and then had a son um, by him. And this gave them a future for their needs in this earth. But is that really all that came out of it? You know it's from God when it gets bigger than your plan could ever be. And this is what I know many of you moms have done, is done the best you can and saw what you can do and tried to provide, and yet God had bigger plans than what you even saw, didn't he? He had bigger plans. You see, the son that she had through this kinsman redeemer was Obed. Obed was the grandfather of David. I don't know if you've heard of David before, but he's a pretty big deal in Israel. This God had it all along. He knew that. And it's funny because even as she walked in trust to him and maybe had somewhat of a plan, I know he's going to provide, we're going to find somebody, she could have tried to go out beyond that and make it happen. And she didn't. You see, that's what us guys do. You guys remember what we were talking about Abram? And Abram meant father of many. And then he didn't have any kids, and it's really embarrassing after a while going, hey, what's your name? Abram. How many kids you got? None. Kind of embarrassing. And then God changed his name to Abraham, which means father of multitudes. And he's like, awesome. His wife was like, really? We have to go to that party. Can you use the other name? No. God called me Abraham. That's what I'm using. But Abraham, although he trusted God to a certain degree, he had a plan to make it happen, didn't he? You see, that's what we do. We're guys. We're going to take control. We're going to make it happen. And so he went out and he got, hey, let's use the concubine, and we'll go ahead and get ourselves a kid, and we'll be good to go. How'd that end up? Not so good. Ruth trusted. God blessed and it then became even more of a blessing than we could imagine. Because David, yes, a big deal. Her son becomes grandfather of David. David is in the line of Christ himself. Huge. And so, God has bigger plans. Elizabeth, 
Elizabeth was pregnant. Okay, she knew um, that her son was to be used of God. <coughs> all right, she knew that that was happening. God gave her inclination, told she was going to be pregnant, and all that. But, but why did she know beyond that? Because she trusted what he said. And when she started to um, bring him up and try and develop him as a man, what do you think she did as she brought him up? Well, I know as, a, as guys, we would have made him study every bit of scripture. He would have been, you know, headed towards the priesthood and everything else. And guess what? Would that have suited where John was headed? You see, John the Baptist was not your average churchgoer of the day. <laughs> he was like way outside of the realm of that. He lived in the wilderness. He was like eating wild honey. He was out of control. His hair was probably like, and they probably looked at him and like, you ever seen that guy, John? Not bad, right? That was the kind of guy that you would look at. He's living out in the wilderness. He's eating honey and stuff. He's his hair's all over the place. His beard's out of control. He's wearing sackcloth kind of stuff like this 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 stuff that isn't comfortable. And he's preaching and everybody goes by. Father would have been out of his mind. How can you be used of God? Look at you. You're out of control. Get a haircut. Take a bath. Do something. But God had a bigger plan for John. That he would come and he would tell the people that somebody bigger and better is coming. But we need to get ready. That bigger and better is the Messiah. And the Messiah was coming for Israel at the time and John was preparing the way for that. And he didn't even understand that it was even bigger than that. Even his plan wasn't bigger. God has bigger plans. Finally, Mary... Mother of Jesus. Same question. What do you think she did bringing Jesus up? How do you think she interacted with him? Understanding that he was literally from God. How do you discipline that kid? Does he need discipline? I don't know. Like, really, you know? I mean, was Jesus ever in trouble? I'm sure she tried to teach him. She had to kind of teach him as a young man what was good, how to interact, what was, you know, pro what does that look like? But what I'm sure she did over and over again, even as she said the time when the angel said, this is what's going to happen, she said, Lord, let it be as you will. I trust you. You're going to make this right. Help me stay out of the way. Help me do the best I can. I get back to my mom, who had us, and we were such good kids. She had hardly had anything to do bringing us up. Such good kids. And how did you do it, Mom? You were baby precious. I was baby precious. <laughs> Still is. Yes. I have, actually have a shirt, and it has a picture of me as a kid, and it says, Pastor Baby Precious. It's hidden far deep in the drawer. Anyway, but how did you do it? How did you deal with the out of control? How did you deal with the craziness? I think praying for God to guide and keep me inside and what to do or yeah. decisions to make. I know you do. I know you do. There's times when you tell kids, yeah, you could do something, and they were shocked that I said, yeah. Other times when they say something, I'd say, no, you can't do that. And it's like, why not? You know? Right. Yeah. And then, you know? Yeah. She got rid of me for three summers. She got rid of John for three summers. That was, see, there's that great plan. No, it's, you do the best you can. I know you prayed a lot. I know you did. And it wasn't always perfect. I remember I got in trouble one time and she decided that she was going to give me a spanking. Spank, spank, spank. Okay, I feel so bad. Then one of them was like, Pfft. It's the worst spanking ever. It was like, like that meant nothing. Okay? But, you tried, and the bigger thing wasn't that kind of thing that we had, but it was, I know that you prayed, I know that you did the best you can. And you struggled as well. You went through different issues and stuff that you struggled with, but ultimately, prayer was at the core of what you did. That God was doing through you amazing things that were beyond you. He did it through others, too. Did you know he did. People would come to your door, come to your house. Yeah. But you were that prayer part 
Um, it's so funny because oftentimes um, we talk about prayer, and it's like, why pray? Didn't God already make the plan? Didn't it? Isn't it just going to go the way that he said it's going to go? Right? But that's not true. Because why did Jesus spend so much time in prayer? You know why he spent so much time in prayer? Because he knew it was part of the Father's plan to begin with. When God saw all that was going to be, and he said, that's the plan, he only saw it in advance because he's God. But in the portion of seeing everything in advance, what did he also see taking place? He saw a prayer there. He saw a prayer there. He saw a prayer there. And he said, heard that. Heard that. In advance. And so the prayer of those who are desperate on their knees and saying, God, it's beyond me. I need you. And I see far more. When I look in here, I see far more women at prayer and at that place on their knees than I see the guys who tended to be like, I can do this. And that is the amazing part, that God has used you because of your faith. And we thank you as products of that faith that God has brought us here. When I talked about all the moms, I definitely wanted to make sure you didn't think I was talking about myself as a Moses. Not even close. But I can tell you this, as wretched and rotten of a soul as I am and can be, and grew up so out of control, this is still a miracle. As out of control as it still is, this is still a miracle, nonetheless. And I thank you for that. I thank him for that, through you. Um, so today, moms, be proud, be thankful, but know that God is not done using you yet. There's still a lifetime to go. Don't stop praying. Don't stop being that source that God is using to touch the lives of the ones you love. Today we thank you. We should thank you every day, but we pick one day so we don't have to worry about it. The rest of them, because that's how we do, right? All right, God bless. We're going to pray and then um, go and be with the families and love one another. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love and for grace and that it has always, always, always been alive and powerful. It's never been about what we do. It's been about what you do through us. And you do through us as we come to the place where we realize it's all about you. That we fall before you and we say, Lord, help us because we cannot help ourselves. Father, on this day, help us to love those around us and to just share how much um, we mean to one another because you've given us that love, even as an idea of what your love is for us. Bless this day, we thank you for it, and we ask that you um, use us this week to touch the world around us. We thank you in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Go and have a great week. Love you, moms. Amen. 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 Amen.